But we are in Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to read verses. Um, looks like it's just two verses. It's a long story for two verses. All right. It says, and straightway, it means immediately, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Once again, we're in Matthew 14. I know I've kind of moved forward. Matthew chapter 14. And we're starting in verse 22. Jesus told his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he sent the multitudes that he had just fed miraculously away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway, immediately, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. I titled this message, you know, I really kind of made the title at the end. And I, I really didn't know exactly what to title it. I ended up titling it, What Does It Look Like When It's Done? Talking about the storm. What does it look like when the storm is done? We've seen ravage because we live in hurricane-torn country. We've seen what it looks like after hurricanes have ripped through here and the mess that has taken place. But the question that I'm asking you this morning from a spiritual sense is, what does it look like in the midst of your life and the surrounding area around your life when the storm is calm? Now, i got to tell you that most times in our life, there's a whole lot more than just one storm that we will encounter. Amen. One of the things that I know about this morning is, is that two of the songs that were sung, both the song about Cornerstone, where it says that it talks about the fact that he's the anchor that holds in the midst of the veil, but also the song Refiner's Fire. Both of those concepts are in this message today because one of the things that sticks out to me when I come across stories in the Bible that talk about storms, automatically I begin to think about the testing and the trials of faith that believers experience. You know, over the last few weeks, it's kind of funny. I didn't plan like a, a series of series, but over the last few weeks, there's been more than one occasion that I've preached on storms. And this morning, I'm going to talk about it again, right? I preached on the storm of Jonah, how he encountered. I don't know if you remember what I, what I told you about, but the Lord told Jonah to go one way. And really, if I drew you a map, the, the truth is, is that Jonah went the opposite way. The Lord told Jonah to go towards Nineveh, which was over there to the east. And instead he went down first unto Joppa and he, and he bought, he bought a, uh, he bought a ticket is what he did. He went down and he bought a ticket to go in the opposite direction. But the, but the direction that ultimately it brought him, uh, I, I used it as a spiritual thought was that when he went in the opposite direction to to go uh, opposite of what the Lord did, he went down. He went down to the area where he bought the ticket, and then he also went down into the ship, and it just kept. He just kept sinking lower till he was in. He was in the belly of the fish, and he went down into the sea. But hallelujah! The further he went down, ultimately he cried out to the Lord, and that's what happens in the life of people. They're either gonna, as they're going down, they're either gonna call out on the Lord, or they're gonna continue to look for something else to try. 
to solace their pain, to try to ease what it is that they're going through. Then I talked about uh, a storm that the disciples encountered again on the, on the, on the uh, Sea of Galilee. And Jesus spoke to the storm and he calmed it. But the interesting thing is, is that right after that, he ended up in the land of the Gadarenes. And you'll remember there was a storm in that demoniac's life. And, and I preached that for Christmas. That was my Christmas message. And I was like, but you know what it was, was that he was sitting there clothed in his right mind. And I said, that's the Christmas message. Hallelujah. The father sent his son, Jesus, to bring healing to people's lives. Yes. Praise God. Listen, I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know where you've been, where you're going, what you've experienced. But I can tell you one thing. When the Lord gets you through the storm or gets you through a storm that you will ever face, then when it's all said and done, hallelujah, it's going to look different than it did before. Hallelujah. Amen. So what will it look like when it's done? Uh, now the, the disciples are facing another storm that is undoubtedly a trial of their faith. And one of the things that stuck out to me is the fact that Peter literally, in a sense, he's walking through the storm. Now, I know the, the big thing here is that Peter gets out on the water just like the Lord did. He walks on water. But, but in the midst of all of that, there's a storm that's taking place. So in a, in a physical sense, he's literally walking in a storm. And I want you to think about that spiritually because the truth is this, is that God desires that we would also be able to walk in the midst of the storm. No matter what it is that we're facing, God wants us to be able to face it. Amen. And he never asked us to face it on our own. Amen. The fact that he walked on the water in the storm once again shows that he was walking in the midst of the storm. I want you to know that Jesus expects us to walk through some things. You got you to understand that. Many times people are looking for an escape route. I mean, God always will never allow you to be tempted that beyond what you're able to, to bear. But he always will provide an escape. But the escape route isn't that I escape into some altered sense of reality. The, 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 the escape route isn't that I try to find something else to take the place of the Lord. The escape route is the plan of, of, of God's salvation and the plan of how we are to walk with him, which requires faith in the Lord. Amen. And as we continue to keep faith in the Lord, we receive grace. And as we receive grace, we're strengthened by God. And we learn through the journeys of life, through the storms that life brings us, how to trust and keep faith in God and to believe that he's able to get us through. Listen to me, we live in the midst of a fallen world. I know that I say that a lot, but there's some things that are going to always be repetitive in my messages. And one thing that will always be repetitive in my message is, and I'm about to prove it to you right here when I read a scripture to you, this world is not your friend. Yeah. That's right. You can try to buddy up with it, you can lock arms with it, you can hold hands with it, you can even try to kiss it. But I'm here to tell you, if you are a Christian, yeah. if, I'm using the conjunction, That's right. just in case you're not. But if you are a Christian and you have been born again, then the Bible teaches, Jesus said it in John 14, that the Spirit of God now lives on the inside of you. If you are a Christian and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, you are a new creation in Christ and you will never be the same. And the Holy Spirit that lives in you is contrary to the spirit of the world that you exist within and the spirit of this world that you exist within is contrary to the Spirit of God that is on the inside of you. But yet, nevertheless, Jesus prayed right before he was going to the cross, and he expected that his disciples would have to go through some things. Right, right. You know how I know that Jesus expected that his disciples would have to go through some things? Because Jesus went through some things. Right. And if Jesus went through some things, then he is expecting that his people will have to go through some things. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 17. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's praying to the Father. Specifically regarding his disciples and the fact that he will be leaving them. He mentions to the father that he asks him now to glorify him with the glory that he had with the father before he came to the earth and before he had become a man. You know, Jesus, if you didn't know this, Jesus was was always God. He was the word that spoke the world into existence. But then he allowed himself to be clothed with the humility of human flesh so that he could do the Father's will. Amen. John 17, starting in verse 14. This is what Jesus says about his disciples. He says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. 
Look at this. So what is he saying? He said, I gave them your word that you gave to me. I mean, this is a, it's a big word. And if you read from the beginning of the story all the way to the end of the story, what you realize is that man, because of the fall, finds himself in a bad situation. He's in the midst of sin. He's broken. He's fallen. He's corrupt. There's, a, there's now a barrier between mankind and God. Because if you look back at the garden story, it teaches us that there was a time when God was able to fellowship with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the midst of the garden. But then after the fall, what happened? Adam hid himself in the midst of the trees hid himself from the voice of God. The whole plan of God results in the fact that God, even in the Old Testament, was promising that he would make a nation called Israel out of one man named Abraham. And through that one man, after he created that nation, ultimately through thousands of years of human history, he would give us Jesus. The word becomes flesh and takes his righteousness. His perfect humanity and offers it on the cross as a sacrifice to bear the burden, to pay the penalty of mankind's sin. And now that truth, that word of truth, that's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, this is God's plan. I've been teaching this to the church since we started. This is God's plan from the beginning of the fall all the way to the end. Even after the enemy of mankind and God is thrown into the Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, which is the last death. Even then, the Bible refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Oh, Nail scarred hands. This is God's plan. This is the Father's plan. He's not going to change His plan for any preacher. He's not going to change His plan for any movement, some new movement in the church. The Father is committed to His plan. Hallelujah. The Father is committed so much so that He bankrupted heaven of its prized possession and He sent it to this corrupted earth in order for one purpose, for you to hear the truth of this gospel. And that's what Jesus is saying. Father, I've given them Your Word. I've given them your word, word, and because of that, the world has hated them. Listen, I said it already, but I'm going to say it again. When the word of God goes forth and your ears hear it and you respond by faith, simple faith. Yet, listen, sometimes I get real technical in here, but let's keep it simple. Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you have the answer for sin. His name was Jesus. And the answer was is that you put him on a cross. He was the innocent one. I was the guilty one. But you allowed a great exchange to take place when I put my faith in what you provided. Hallelujah. He took my guilt, you gave me his righteousness, and now that barrier that started in the garden has been removed, and now there's a connection. Hallelujah. We're back, we're back together with God. We're back together connected to the Spirit of God, where God's Spirit can move on our hearts. But listen, the world will hate the disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not saying that you won't ever meet somebody in the world that you are compadres with and that you, you know what I'm saying, give them some knuckles and, hey, we go eat lunch. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that the spirit that drives the world is contrary to the spirit of God. And if the spirit of God lives on the inside of you, then the spirit of the world is going to hate you. That's right. That's right. Jesus goes on to say this. He says, even as I am not of the world, I pray not. This is what Jesus' prayer is for his disciples. He says, I pray not that you should take them out of the world. Jesus is praying that you would not escape out of the world. Jesus, oh, you, there's going to be a day when he will come back for his church, hallelujah, and in the glorious blessed hope, the rapture of the church, we will, gravity will lose its hold and we will be out of here, but not one second before the Lord desires for that to happen. Amen. Jesus says, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that instead you would keep them from the evil. He was, he's praying that they would keep them from the evil. Now, in the Greek text, the idea here is the evil one. The evil one and the spirit that is behind this world that is corrupted that we live within. Two different kingdoms that are coexisting. Two different problems that, that are taking place. He says, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that instead you would keep them from the evil. Listen, the Lord's not going to just necessarily pluck you out of the midst of the storm that you're in. That's right. That's right. The matter of fact is, is that God wants you to want to come out of the storm and to trust him in the midst of it all. 
there he goes on to say they are not of the world even as I am not of the world sanctify them through your truth your word is truth you know I've used this term concept before to explain to you that the word sanctify or sanctification it means to be made holy the, the, the way that you were made holy was faith in Christ and the fact that God put you in him amen, amen? we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute but it also has the idea of a separating out when you put faith in Christ and, and, you, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, now you're different than the world around you. You're separated out from the world and now you're in a new place and that new place is called in Christ. Yeah. If you can envision yourself walking around inside of Jesus, hallelujah, you're in him. Yes. The main thought of this passage is that Jesus' disciples are those that have received the word of God through faith. Amen. Let me just describe to you again the concept of faith in the cross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just draw you a little picture up here. I, sometimes I'll do it while I'm standing up over there. But sometimes there's new people in here. And I just want you to know that we had a first birth. And our first birth was in Adam. I don't think we can talk about this enough. And in our first birth in Adam, I don't know if you can see it, but he's all broken. He's crooked. He's dead. He's not happy. Because in Adam, we were born in sin. Separated from God. But hallelujah, God had a beautiful plan. His plan was to send his son Jesus to die on the cross. Hallelujah. And to, to pay the penalty for, for our sin. And listen, when you hear that gospel message and you put faith, that's what I'm putting, faith. Faith, not just in the fact that Jesus was a good teacher, right. not just in the fact that Jesus was a, a miracle worker, but in the fact that Jesus came to be the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for sin for this fallen world. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter 6 and in the book of Colossians also and in other spots that whenever that happened, a miracle took place where you changed locations. Amen. You moved into a new neighborhood. Yes. See, when you gave, you put your faith in Christ, you might not have known this. Oh, preacher, I got saved when I was 12 years old, and I made business with God, and my life has been nothing but a storm since then, and I do not feel like I changed neighborhoods. Matter of fact, I feel like I still live on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, guess what? Let me tell you something. It don't matter what you've experienced. It don't matter what you think. I'm trying to tell you what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that anyone who is in Christ has become a new creation. The Bible teaches in the book of Colossians that you are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That's what the word of God says. And that is what we have to learn the truth in order to believe in that, to have faith in that, that God's word says something about us. Yes, yes. Says something about us in Christ. Because you see, in the mind of the Father, a miracle happened on that day. Whenever you put your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, in the mind of the Father, according to the way he wrote his word, he's not going to change his mind. According to the way he wrote his word, hallelujah, the Bible teaches that you died with Jesus. It's almost like here you are born of Adam, born dead in sin, and the day that you believed, when was it for you? For me, it was back in the 1980s sometime at a little church in Berwick, Louisiana, Twin City Gospel. I heard the gospel message, ran to the altar and said, Jesus, I need you to come into my heart. Listen to me. On that day, a miracle happened. Yeah. Matt didn't yeah. understand it completely, but I'm telling you, I felt it. Yeah. I felt the yeah. spiritual miracle that took place in my life. And the Holy Spirit took me from that first birth in Adam and he rushed me over here. It was though in God's mind, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit brought me back 2,000 years and put me in Jesus and God the Father saw me in him as, I, as he died on the cross I was in him Amen. as he was buried in the tomb I was in him I used to travel around and I'd preach in different churches and I got this lady at this old church I used to go to she was really talented with styrofoam and stuff and I said could you make me this right here and I, I, preach this, I preach the same message all the time I was born of Adam, but Adam died. Hallelujah. The old man born of Adam died. A new man has been resurrected in newness of life. The father saw me in Christ. Rest in peace, Adam. And a new man was born again. I'm trying to talk to you about the message of truth. I'm trying to talk to you about the way that God sees you. I'm trying to explain to you the way the word of God says that you were delivered from the previous kingdom that you were born into in your physical life and that through your born again experience you were translated into a spiritual kingdom where you got you moved into a new neighborhood. And in this new neighborhood, I don't know where you want to live, but I want to live where the presence of the Lord is. 
You go on and try to navigate life out there when the winds are contrary or boisterous and the waves are contrary to your life. Go on. Go on and try to live that in your own strength. Go on and try to face that storm in your own strength. You will be pummeled. You will be beaten. You will be crashed against a barnacle reef. And you'll be all cut up and all jacked up and all messed up. But hallelujah, whenever you come to the end of yourself and you surrender to the Lord and trust in Him, He will move you into a new neighborhood. You might even be living there right now, but you just don't know it because you're not experiencing the grace because God is not going to pour His grace out in the midst of a situation when a person doesn't have their faith right. Listen to me. You can't look for an escape route. Jesus said, I'm not asking you to remove them from the world. I'm asking you to keep them from the evil. From this evil world that's, that's trying to overwhelm and overcome. That's the message of the cross. That's the truth that Jesus gave to his disciples. That's what I'm trying to talk about. The word of God, when embraced, it makes people different than the world. According to this chapter, the world hates those that are not their own. Amen. This point, I've already said it, is that the spirit of the world is against the spirit of God. Hallelujah. But Jesus' prayer is that they wouldn't be removed, but that instead... They would go through it, that they would be protected from evil. Amen. And many times this journey that we're on, we will have to face hard trials and storms in life. But it's part of God's will in some way. I don't understand. Oh, listen to me. Don't get don't be confused. Well, preacher, I thought that it would have been the devil's will to cause all. Yeah, of course, it's the devil's will to cause all this turmoil in your life. And the Bible teaches us clearly that let no man say when he's tempted by evil that he's tempted of God. For God is not tempted by evil, neither does he tempt any man with evil. Amen. God's not the orchestrator of trying to ruin your life. No, but he is the ultimate conductor of the whole symphony. And he will allow, just as the book of Job teaches us, for certain things to be allowed into your life. He will allow the door to be opened a little bit if that's what you choose to do. He will allow various things to take place in your life because the devil has a will for your life. I need you to understand that this morning. The devil's will for your life is that you would refuse to turn to the Lord and that you instead would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. But God has a will in all of that. His will is that you would surrender to him, that you would trust in him, that you would turn to his truth. And that through that, his grace would empower you, strengthen you and heal you. And hallelujah, because of it. Finally, I'm preaching to the preacher. Finally, that rebellious heart, that refusal to bend, that refusal to surrender and shook its face, its fist in the face of God would now realize, Lord, you love me all. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. In spite of myself. I was fighting you every step of the way. I was refusing to bow my knee to you, but yet you never stopped loving me. Oh, somebody that you live with might stop loving you. They might get tired of what you've been going through. They might get tired of what you've been dealing with. They might just get frustrated. Somebody that you work with, that you, that you know on a close level, they might just get real irritated with you and snap at you. But Jesus will never grow tired of you. Hallelujah. But at the same time, he, he, he's not going to force you to come to him. Amen. He gave you a free will and he wants you to take your free will and give it to him. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yes. The testing of one's faith is an ongoing truth that is reported, repeated in scripture. The truth about Jesus was that he was, that he was the son of God. Amen? That's one of the testimonies of Jesus, right? Yes. He is the son of the living God. Yes. Well, guess what? The enemy came in and said... Oh, really? Well, let's put you to the test. Let's put you to the test and prove that you are indeed who you say you are. The Bible teaches that those that would believe in, the, in his name, Jesus, he gave them power to be the sons of God. So he's the son of God and he was tested by the devil. And we call, we call ourselves as Christians sons of God, right? Yes. If that's your testimony, that you're a Christian and you think you're not going to be tested, you think you're not going to be put through the trial, to find out what you're made of, to find out whether or not you will truly hold on, to find out whether or not, oh, well, that just seems cruel. No, God has a plan. God has a plan, and if we will trust him, amen, he will get us through it, and something's going to happen in the end that's so beautiful that you will know him better than you ever knew him before. You will be able to see him more clearly than you ever saw him before, and you will be able to love him for the way that he is worthy to be loved, and if you just sat through and you skated through life, none of that would ever happen in your, in your life. 
If his testimony was that he was the son of God and he was tested, so will ours be that way. And look, Peter had a revelation of it. He's the one that walked on water in our story. But look what he wrote later on in life. After the Lord had been crucified and he had denied Jesus and many years being in the church, he wrote this letter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. This is one of the scriptures that was in there and went along with one of their songs that they sang. This is what Peter says. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold tempt temptations. You know, I like that word temptation because many times when we hear the word temptation, we automatically think of some lustful thing that we have our, our flesh desires. What you pick your poison. I don't need to sit here and spell it out. Everybody's got weaknesses in their life and everybody gravitates towards certain things. But, the, the, but, but one of the meanings of this word in the Greek is that it's an experiment, a trial, a testing. All temptations are a trial. The, uh, Peter says this, though you, this is a season in your life. And if need be, if the Lord sees fit, then you're going to be in some heaviness through this temptation. Why? So that the trial of your faith, by the way, which is much more precious than that of gold, which perishes. Though it be tried with fire, though your faith be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Sometimes walking with the Lord is a rough thing, <laughs> you know? It's like I can't see him. I can't see him. I can't touch him. He's not palpable all the time, right? I mean, I'm, he's never been palpable other than to the disciples as far as in a physical sense. But no, that doesn't mean you can't feel him. Yeah. That doesn't mean you feel, can't feel his presence. But sometimes we can't feel him right. We can't see him right. We're not yeah. hearing him right. And yet yeah. at the same time, there's something that drives us forward as his spirit lives on the inside of us. Yeah. And gives us a desire to trust him. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's true that in all of our lives there have been times <laughs> when we've been brought, when we've brought on our own trials. Yeah. Amen. I don't know about you, but I know I have brought on our own trials, times that we invite trouble and chaos. We don't like it when that happens. You know what I'm saying? We, and we, and we, the devil wants to convince us that it wasn't us. Have you ever noticed that? I'm telling you right now, back in the old days, back when I was living my life a certain way, it was everybody else's fault but mine. And even still sometimes, when something doesn't go my way, it's like, it's everybody else's fault but mine. Yeah. I was just reading this passage the other day when I was preparing for Wednesday, and I like this, and I said, you know what, I'm going to use this on Sunday. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 through 18. This is about what Matt has sounded like in the past. It says, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. Look what Ahab said. He said unto him, you are he that troubles Israel. And Elijah turns around and he says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house. Why? Because you forsook the commandments of the Lord and you have followed after Balaam. Yeah. I didn't cause this trouble that we see in the midst of Israel, but instead it was you. So we're talking about the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament, but the same thing still happens spiritually in the life of New Testament believers. No, it wasn't this one. It wasn't that one. It wasn't that one over there. Sometimes in our lives, we cause our own trouble and our own chaos because, number one, we, we opened up our mouth when it ought not been opened. We made decisions that we shouldn't have made. Yep. We went in a direction that we didn't go. If we just would have been able to keep our trap shut <laughs> in that deal right there, we wouldn't have offended someone, and then we wouldn't have felt the repercussions of because we got them aggravated. We got them mad. Guess what? Sometimes people, now you, you don't have a right to hold on to your bitterness. That's right. right. The, the Lord died on a cross, man. Listen to me. They, they beat his back to shreds. They blindfolded him and they slapped him and they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that strikes you. They plucked his beard out and as he hung naked on the cross, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he wasn't just throwing some lifeless words out there. Jesus was speaking truth. He was asking him that the Father would truly forgive those that had mistreated him. Yeah. You don't have a right to hold on to your bitterness. Jesus didn't hold on to bitterness. At the same time, hallelujah, we got to realize sometimes we bring chaos on ourselves there's another scripture in the new testament that says don't give place to the devil i did this wednesday night i think more people can see if i come over here 
But I was thinking to myself, it's kind of like a deal. Don't give place to the devil. It's like you open the door up a little bit. If I get locked out, I'll knock on the door. <laughs> but it's kind of like sometimes we're just curious. Well, what is it that's going on over here? What's, what's going on on the other side of this door, man? What's happening over here? Let me just take a little peek. But on the other side, see what's happening is when you open up that door, next thing you know, he got footed. Mm -hmm. He's got a foot in there, and guess what he does? He don't stop. He starts squirming his way, boy. He starts working his way in there, and he marches up in here, and he's like, all right, now it's party time. Let's go on. You opened up the door. You let me in. You invited me in. Now a little bit of chaos, a little bit of storm. Yeah. And the reality of it is is that I've come to this conclusion in my own life. Listen to me. I'm preaching to you things that I have lived. I'm preaching to you. I'm, I'm not, not just talking about back in the day when I was in the world doing drugs and drinking alcohol and running around like some kind of a fool. I'm talking to you that even after Christianity, the struggles, the trials, the tribulations that I would go through and, and opening up doors and allowing the enemy to come in. Allowing him to wreak havoc in my life. Allowing chaos to take place. Like Ahab, when we forsake God in his ways, we open up the door to sin. We invite trouble in. But listen, even if you would say, but I, didn't, I don't think I did that. I mean, there's always a time when we're going to do a little something like that. <laughs> but let's just say right now you're in the midst of a trial and you don't feel as though you're the one that initiated. Right. Still, it's God's will. Not that you just escaped this fallen earth. But that instead you be kept from the influence of the evil one and the pathway that he's trying to bring people down and that you would not quit. Jesus didn't quit. Hallelujah. And he certainly doesn't want you to quit. Instead, he wants you to make it through the trial in a God honoring way. That brings me to my next passage of scripture. We hadn't even gotten to my point yet. I know I need to hustle up. Romans chapter five, verses one through five. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. I'm just going to go ahead and try to break it down as we go through. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, Therefore, he's, he's talked about some things beforehand. He says, therefore, because of all this stuff I just talked to you about, what did he basically, in a nutshell, he, tra he taught us in chapter 3 that all men are guilty. Yes. According to the God's standard of righteousness, which is Jesus, all men are guilty. But God made a way. He sent Jesus, who, who, who in Romans 4, he taught us, justifies or makes righteous people through faith, through faith in what Jesus did, not through faith in what they did. Amen. That's another story. That's a work that's preaching against works. I don't have time to go there right now, but I don't care how much you read your Bible, how much you come to church, how much you pray. Those actions that, from, that you do do not make you righteous. It was the actions of Jesus and what he did for you at the cross yeah. that makes you righteous. Yeah. The other way is self-righteousness. This way is uh, imputed righteousness. In other words, J God lays the righteousness of Jesus on you. He clothes you with Jesus' righteousness. When does that happen? When you put faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross. Yes. When you put faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross and, all, and you are forgiven of all your sins, the Bible teaches, if you will, that you've been clothed clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Right. And you know what that means? It means that now you're justified by faith. Declared. De declared righteous. That's the difference. Righteousness is a standing. Justification is a declaration of that standing, meaning God declares that you're righteous. Oh, That's yeah. what the Father sees when he looks at you. Hallelujah, because you're in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Preacher, I feel bad because of what I did last night, last week, two months ago. You got to get off that trip, man. The devil wants to try to lie to you and condemn you and fill you full of guilt. It's not based upon what you do. It's based upon what Jesus did. Yeah. Until you get a revelation of that, hallelujah, yeah. you will walk around in condemnation and guilt. But yeah. when you begin to get a revelation of, of the fact that you're justified, the Father has declared you righteous because Jesus did the right thing all the time. I can tell it to you till you're blue in the face. But once you get a revelation of it from the Holy Spirit, you will be set free in liberty. Hallelujah. And the Lord will begin to strengthen you and you will walk in peace. That's what it says. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever felt in your life that you didn't have peace with God? Come on, somebody. 
chaos, turmoil. Oh, yeah. The storm is raging. Don't feel like God's in the middle of it all. Can't see him, can't feel him. Don't know what, what is that apparition out there? Is that a spirit? What is that? I can't see right. Is right. that Jesus really? Would Jesus even show up in the midst of a mess like this? Right. Would Jesus have anything to do with a mess like this? This can't be God. No, sometimes it is the Lord. Yeah. 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 By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Good news, good news. Yeah. No matter what you're going through, hallelujah, because you've been justified by faith and you've been made righteous in the eyes of God, you have access by your faith in Christ to grace. Hallelujah. And that grace will strengthen you. Yeah. That grace will strengthen you. It will encourage you. It will help you stand. That's what the text says. Wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You have something to rejoice in, saints, because let me tell you why. One day, you're no longer going to be on this earth. You know how sometimes whenever you're worshiping the Lord and the music is beautiful and they're singing about Jesus and you're like wanting to thank him and then all of a sudden you get this crazy thought in your mind. Something that's not right. Something that's sinful. That's because one, but let me tell you, good news is that one day that sinful nature is going to be eradicated from your life. One day you're going to, you have hope in the glory of God that God is going to eradicate that and that you will no longer have a sinful nature and God will be able to be worshipped by you the way that he deserves to be worshipped. But listen, we have something to glory in. We, we have something to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because one day that's going to happen. But not only so, we also glory in tribulation. What about today? What about the things that I'm facing today? What about the storm, preacher? We glory in tribulations yes. also. Now, the reason we glory in the tribulation is because we start to understand after we've been in the faith for a little while that the tribulation produces something in our life. Amen. This text goes on to say that tribulations work patience. Patience, experience, and experience hope. Yeah. I got to tell you that the word uh, tribulation means to be pressed. I'm, i got to move through this kind of quick. Tribulation means to be pressed. When you get pressed like in a storm, when you get pressed like in a trial, it begins to work something in you. That word patience there, I always like this word. I heard it from Brother Larson. I don't know how long ago, and I never forgot it. Probably like 18 years ago or something. Hupo mone. Yes. I love that word. It's a, it, you know, in the Greek, the, the words are compound words. This word right here is a preposition, and it means under. And this word right here means remain. Under, remain. Remain under. So when you're getting pressed, when you're in the midst of the tribulation, the word of the Lord, Jesus didn't say, take them out of here. Go ahead and take As soon as you see the first sign of danger, little father, take them out. No. I'm not asking you to remove them. Instead, I'm asking that you keep them from the evil one, from the presence of this evil earth, and that they would stay connected to you and that they would truly be your disciples. The word of God wants you and I to remain under the trial in a God-honoring way, where we would allow the grace of God to change us, to strengthen us, and to encourage us as we walk through the storm, hallelujah, and we come out on the other side, it does something in us. See that word experience right there? Patience is connected to experience. The word, if you looked it up in other translations, it would use the word character. That's what it says. Yeah. Because the word, that's what the word describes, is character. It, it, whenever you are being pressed in your life in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trial, and you have to learn patience or endurance, the hupomone, as you go through a trial, it begins to produce character in you. Real quick, I, I know I used to... I used to use this example a lot, so some of you have heard this before. But the Greek word for this in the noun is, is a dokimai. And what that word was used was to describe people in the old days that were money exchangers. Back in the Bible times, they were money exchangers. And what people would do is, it's kind of a bad analogy, but it, it, it's the only way I know how to describe it. Nowadays, whenever people sell drugs, they'll cut drugs. Like they'll, if they got a pound of cocaine, they'll cut it in half and then they'll take a, a half a pound of something else and they'll mix it all together. Take a half a pound of something like this and they'll mix it all together and then it gives them more. But what they've done is they've diluted their product. In the Old Testament, in these ancient Bible times, what would happen is, is that money exchangers would clip the coins. They'd shave a little sliver because the, the, the coins were made out of precious metals, whether it was silver or gold. And they'd shave a little sliver of it off of there. And then after they've shaved several slivers, they could melt it down and they could come up with another coin. 
And so what would happen, though, is that people began to become aware of their practices, and they were, they were like, we're not getting a good deal here. We're, we're over here exchanging this for this, but we're not really getting, because after a coin's been clipped so many times, you're not getting. But Adoki Mai was one who had developed a reputation as he doesn't clip coins, and he doesn't deal with coins that have been clipped. You can trust him. His character is proven. He's yeah. been through the trial. He keeps on showing himself to be approved. It's an approvedness. When you've been pressed in the midst of the trial, and you remain under the trial in a God-honoring way, you come out on the other side with an approvedness or a character that God says, this is like a doki mai. Hallelujah. He holds on to me. He's not perfect, but he's holding on to me in the midst of the trial, and he's moving through. I got four quick points that I want to share with you. All right? You with me? We're going to go through this quick. Point number one, sometimes there is fear and doubt in the trial. In, ver in chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, it says that when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. I was thinking about the fact that physically, literally, the wind was blowing. I'm sure their eyes were hurting and probably dried up from all the wind. Plus, I'm sure there was rain. Rain was pelting them in the face. The waves were contrary. Mist coming off of the ocean. And here comes Jesus walking, and they can barely make him out. They just see some image out there. Nobody expects Jesus to come walking on the water. What is this? It's a spirit. And they were, they were greatly full of fear. You know, I was thinking about the fact that when we're in spiritual struggle, many times the chaos from that spiritual struggle is so intense, so bad, that it becomes difficult for us to see Jesus clearly in the midst of it all. We get so focused on all the chaos that's going on around us, it makes it difficult to see Jesus in the middle of it. And like I said earlier, sometimes we're thinking, there's no way that the Lord's in all of this. This is way too big of a mess. And so we have a hard time recognizing it. We have a hard time recognizing, though, Jesus will always be, if you are truly his follower, right smack dab in the middle of Hallelujah. your situation. Remember that old story I just came to my mind about footprints in the sand? And it said, well, Lord, I thought you were with me the whole time. I saw foot, but the worst times of my life, I didn't even see any footprints in the sand. Oh, I was there. Those were the times I was carrying you. You didn't know I was there, but you couldn't even, you weren't even strong enough to walk in the middle of it all. But I was right there with you every step of the way. You might not have been able to see it because it was such a mess. You might not have been able to hear me because it was such a mess, but I was right there with you all the way. If you're a child of God, I'm telling you right now, God will be with you. The enemy's going to try to strike doubt and fear in your life, but the Lord, hallelujah, is with you. That was point number one. You might not be able to see him clearly. Sometimes there might be doubt and fear, but this is point number two. I want your will, God. Amen. Do you want God's will this morning in your life? Yes. yes. Praise God. Chapter 14, verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And then what did the Lord say? And he said, come. Hallelujah. I don't know how you're going to do this. I'm in the midst of the greatest trial of my life. Everything is such a mess. I don't know how I'm going to come out on the other. I don't know what it's going to look like on the other side of this storm. But God, I want your will. I might not know how you're going to accomplish it. How in the world a man going to walk on the water? I don't know. How, I don't know about all that. I don't know how you're going to get it done. But I know this. I want your will, Lord. Yeah. There's often uncertainty and fear of the unknown when we're in the trial. But the main thing that our hearts should really want is God's will through it all. Amen. Even when we don't understand how he's going to do it. Are you facing something right now in your life and you don't understand? I want God's will and I know God's will is for me to do this or God's will is for me to feel this way, but I don't know how in the world he's going to do it. I don't see how he can do it in spite of all of that. Yes. Amen. Do you want God's will? Hallelujah. Point number three, focus on the truth, not the storm. Jesus is the truth. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the truth. It says in John 14, 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Peter got his eyes off of the Lord. Sometimes the chaos and the trials are so severe that it's impossible for us to keep our eyes on Jesus. I mean, in our own strength, it's impossible for us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Because there's so many times when we're trying to walk with God in our own strength and the strength of man will never be able to get us through the harshest of trials. You listen, that's the whole point about faith. 
If you have friends that are real smart, do you have any friends that are real smart that don't know the Lord or don't believe in God? And listen, I tend to be, I have some fault in this. I try to figure some stuff out logically a lot of times. The God that we serve is not always logical. The God that we serve transcends natural boundaries. And the reality of it is, is that he's the one that can really get us through the whole thing. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Peter found himself in the midst of this storm and he was weakened. But look, like Paul learned through the words of the Lord, Jesus' strength is made perfect in the middle of human weakness. When you find yourself at your weakest point, the word of God says that Jesus' strength is made perfect. I was just thinking, you know, maybe sometimes we have to experience a storm so violent that it unnerves us to the point that there is nowhere else to look but to Jesus. What I'm trying to get at is, what have you tried? Once again, I'm not going to fill in your blanks. You fill in your own blanks. I know what I've tried. What have you tried to fix or remedy your situation? Sometimes the try, and God knows exactly how to get each person. Like what it takes to get your attention may not be what it takes to get someone else's attention. But a storm that's violent enough to unnerve us to the point where even though the wind is still howling, even though the waves are still contrary, I gotta, I'm like, uh oh, he got me now. He, he's got my attention now. Lord! Because see, what happened was Peter got his eyes off the Lord and he started to sink and he was about to die. And at one last moment, he said, Lord, save me. And the Lord reached down and saved him. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes it takes that. The violence of the storm has to be turned up enough to where we are willing to forsake everything else that ain't really been working. And to turn our eyes back on the Lord. Point number four is this. Once he delivers you out of your storm, you will love him like never before. Hallelujah. I'm closing with this thought right here. <laughs> Once he delivers you from your storm, you will love him like never before. In verses 32 and 33, it says this. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. When you really put, because Je Jesus and Peter came back into the ship. That's what they're talking about. They, the plural pronoun. When they, Jesus and Peter, came back into the ship, all of a sudden, the storm ceased. You know, I just thought of this while I said that. Sometimes you got to watch out for who you got in your boat. The mariners in the story of Jonah had Jonah on their boat. And they had a big old storm because Jonah was on their boat. When you have people that are living in the midst of rebellion... In your boat, there may be the fact that it wasn't all you. Well, you made the choice, but you brought them into your boat. That you got chaos and trial and tribulation going on. But look, when you put Jesus in the boat, look what happens. The wind ceased. Yeah. Oh, but I've tried Jesus. Oh, don't make me go back to telling you what my brother-in-law told that dude on Bourbon Street so many years ago. No, you don't try Jesus like he's a pair of shoes and throw him back in the closet when you think he doesn't fit. No, you surrender to Jesus. He's the master. Hallelujah. You're the servant. He's the potter. You're the clay. You surrender to him and you allow him to have his way and his will in your life. And whenever you do that, he sees fit. Then he will tell the storms to cease and they will obey. You. That's how that works. But look, when the wind ceased, what did they do? They worshipped him. The word worshipped in the Greek language is proskunio, and I definitely believe it's where we get our word prostrate from, where you would lay down upon the face and just prostrate yourself before the Lord. But there's one aspect to this definition in the Greek that has always intrigued me, and I'm about to share it with you. You ready? The meaning in the Greek, one of the meanings in the Greek is to lick the hand. What is, what is the image that you get in your mind when you when I when I tell you that to lick the hand? Anybody? Go ahead. Throw it off. A dog. That's what I think of. A dog. A dog licking his master's hand. And now listen, be, be, be careful, preacher, that you don't turn everybody off. I ain't licking nobody's hand. I'm a man's man. Hold on a second. I don't know a whole lot about dogs. I really don't. I had a dog one time, and I felt like I loved that dog, but I couldn't even take care of that dog. I'm like, that's why I don't really have a dog right now. I have a hard time taking care of my own self. <laughs> but I have seen dogs. I like dogs. And I've watched dogs sometimes. And, you know, if you just see that dog sitting there, and he's, and he's like licking that hand, and it's almost like in his eyes he's got this look of loyalty. Yeah. And I don't understand why he, why, it's like, I, don't, I know that he doesn't have the cognition to understand 
this is my master. I love him. He gives me food. He gives me drink. And, but he's just sitting there. He's loyal. Yeah. And he's licking the hand. Mm -hmm. Whenever Jesus got in the boat and those winds ceased, they worshiped him. I think about the fact that sometimes when we're going through storms of life, sometimes those storms are so bad that they unnerve us to the point where we put our eyes back on the Lord. When we put our eyes back on the Lord and he brings us through the midst of that trial and he causes the storm to cease, that we're kind of like that. A new level of loyalty that we yeah. never had before. Yeah. A new level of love that we never had before. A new level of desiring to be pleasing to the Lord that we never had before. That's one of the problems that we have in all of our lives is a refusal to submit, mm -hmm. yeah. to submit to authority. And Jesus is no different. Many times we have a refusal to submit our lives to his will.